Good evening. My name is Cedric Geffen. It gives me great honor to invite you here tonight to join us on this um, seventh event for the year. We have the pleasure of hosting Michael Kretzmer, a wonderful documentarian who will share with him, with us, um, this amazing event. Sorry, I've lost my, my notes and therefore I'm, uh, I'm stumbling a bit. A bit. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I am uh, going to hand over now to Michael uh, without any further ado, because unfortunately on my screen, I've lost my notes. So Michael, please jump in straight away without further ado. Thank you. Hello, can people hear me? I presume you can. Great. Um, uh, Khabarim, it's really wonderful to see you all and see so many people. And I thank you very much. And I thank Cedric very much for setting up this event. Um, I'm particularly honored to be part of uh, something to do with March of the Living. And I see the role that I have now uh, to raise awareness of the Holocaust as very much in the tradition of March of the Living. I see this as a, dem a democratized process where we Jews take control of our relations and our attitude to Lithuania. Because I must say at the moment, I don't think we are well served by all of our community leaders in this regard. This will become clear as I speak more and you'll understand why I make this assertion. Perhaps I should start by telling you a little of my family because it's relevant to the story and how we grew up. We were a typical Litvak family. We were, both my parents were from South Africa. My mother, my late mother was born in Krugersdorp. My late father was born in uh, Hellbrunn, Orange Free State. Uh, but we were raised in what was then Rhodesia, obviously later became Zimbabwe. Um, but all the institutions of our, of our society, uh, our community and our home were Litvak. Uh, um, um, our attitude to the Holocaust, I think, was also fairly typical, although, of course, we were aware of it. And of course, uh, all our uh, psychological um, perceptions were were tainted by it and conditioned by it. We never really discussed it and we never really discussed the Lithuanian Holocaust in particular. We have these photographs of families who never survived. And over the years, they drifted to the bottom of the photograph pile. We lost the names once my grandparents died. And that was it. And I look on this, uh, this amnesia and I, I, I wonder about it because my parents spoke liberally about everything, uh, in particular the Holocaust, but never about Lithuania. And I think the shame of Lithuania, the scale of the uh, indignity of their violence um, was just too much to bear. I'm not sure one generation can move creatively and constructively to the next carrying that sort of burden. And I think that's another reason uh, the Lithuanian Holocaust was not mentioned very often or very specifically in our home. It was simply too painful. And to get to, to live, one had to simply ignore it for, uh, for at least the first two generations after the event. I do feel now today it is the duty of my generation, which is what I call the third generation afterwards, uh, some would call it the second, uh, to deal with the subject we have, which is Lithuanian Holocaust denial. Um, so how did my relationship with Lithuania begin? It began in 2019 when a dear cousin of mine invited me or gave me the opportunity to say Kaddish for all our relatives who were murdered in the town of Birje in northern Lithuania, uh, Birge in Yiddish. There are very probably some people in this audience whose family also came from Birje because it had quite a significant uh, Jewish population. Let me tell you a little bit about Birje. We Jews were 40% of the population. We were 75% of the businesses. Uh, two of the three doctors in the town were Jewish. Two of the three lawyers in the town were Jewish. There were something like six shuls. There, were bet midrash, there was a Bet Midrash. In fact, there were several study houses. There was Cheder. There were Jewish theater groups. There was a Jewish choir. Uh, of course, there was a Hebra Kedisha and all the other institutions. But we were very much part and parcel of that town and had been for over 600 years. Um, then in July 1941, everything changed. The Germans came, well, the Soviets left. And this air, uh, ushered in uh, a, a period where we were simply, we woke up one day to discover we were no longer human beings. 
Um, we were persecuted. There were uh, very uh, theatrical rapes. There were very theatrical murders, such as tying the beard of an elderly Jew to a, to a horse and dragging him around the town to his death. Then in the last night, we were um, segregated and imprisoned in the synagogue. And the following day, we were marched to a, a lovely local grove of the local forest where we were all butchered. There were 2,400 people murdered in a day. Um, I was at this event and we said the Kaddish, and then we had the shroud covering the, uh, the uh, memorial wall. Uh, it was drawn back and then I found myself facing literally scores of Kretzmers. And I suddenly realized this is where my father's family went. They were all murdered because we were a terribly small family. And this was the reason why I was looking at all my relatives. And as I say, there were dozens of them. Um, before I leave Birger, I want to mention the issue of names. 2,400 people were murdered in uh, Birger on the uh, 8th of August, 1941. Uh, our group, which included some very prominent academics and some very brilliant people, and in, in concert with Yad Vashem, tried to find the names of the people who'd been murdered. And they could only come up with 550 names. This is true all across Lithuania. Basically, our murderers didn't care about our names because we were no longer human and people who aren't human don't deserve names. So no names were, 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 were very few names were, were, were gathered. And in fact, it is a disgraceful fact to, the, to this day of the 200 mass murder sites in Lithuania, only four have any names at all. In other words, they were so successful in their, in their murder of us that they even managed to murder our names. What happened in Birger happened everywhere across Lithuania. There were three stages to the slaughter and I'm afraid I have to be precise about what happened because without knowing these terrible facts, one cannot possibly know what our current obligations are. The three stages to the slaughter were the first stage when the Soviets left and the Lithuanian and before the Nazis came in when Lithuanian nationalists just ran riot. This was an era of performative torture of girls taken into uh, woods and raped literally to death, of children being chopped to pieces and left so their parents could see them, of people being beheaded, of limbs being cut off, of eyes being gouged out. Um, suddenly we were faced with the worst, um, the worst depraved cruelty one could imagine with no way of responding. The second stage was our incarceration. During this stage, the Jews were herded into ghettos um, often their, their synagogues, um, and, but even here, there was a very careful cruelty. It was never um, a, a, a organizational thing. The whole purpose of it always was to dehumanize and to torture us and to rob us of any uh, humanity that we might have had before. The stage was murder. This was mostly by, by, by bullets, but it was also by boots and fists and stakes and, bury, and burial alive and everything else they could dream of to torture us. Um, but the, by the end of the, uh, of the murder, uh, 220,000, approximately 220,000 Lithuanian Jews were dead. Um, this was 96.4% of our population. It was the highest in all of Holocaust Europe. And so one of our greatest post-exilic civilizations, uh, Yiddish Lithuania, or Lita, was destroyed. Uh, this civilization, one can't emphasize enough the grandeur of this civilization. Many writers put it on a scale of, of Bavel and, and Spain, and it was destroyed in a matter of weeks. Um, Another thing one must bear in mind is that almost all the murders in Lithuania and all the organization for the murders was carried out by Lithuanians at every level of society. Certainly the Nazis gave them the permission to do it, but everything was done voluntarily by thousands and thousands of Lithuanians. And to this day, not a single Lithuanian has stood trial for these crimes, not one. We know what happened in Lithuania, thanks to a truly remarkable man, a man called uh, Konyachovsky, Leib Konyachovsky. Konyachovsky was an engineer who lived in Kaunas or Kovno, 
uh, who managed to escape the slaughter. And after the war, he traveled the DP camps um, and the villages of Lithuania to try and find eyewitnesses account uh, to the slaughter. Now these testimonies were published, I think two years ago by a remarkable Australian South African Jew, a man called David Solly Sandler. I don't know if David is with us tonight, but this man deserves great credit for this work. It is a truly remarkable book. This is the book, and uh, later during the film, I will put down the uh, ISBN number so people can buy it if they want. But this is 121 eye testimonies from all over the country of what happened in these little villages and shtetls uh, and towns. And it is a compendium. It is a, a collection of tales of cruelty that is sim it simply beggars belief. You cannot believe that people could have done such a thing, nor that we could have found ourselves in such a defenseless situation. I would really recommend you buy this book. It's unlikely you will read it very often, but it is a testimony of what happened to it. And it is a remarkable document uh, of truth. And truth is very hard to come by in Lithuania today. Um, so to go back to my story. So I, I hid behind a camera when I was in Birge and I made a, a film, a, a sort of travelogue film about the event where we showed the march to the, to, to the death pit, the ceremonies, the various things that went on, the way we were greeted by the local community. And I guess I produced a fairly schmaltzy, inaccurate version of the truth of Lithuania. One thing it did do, and I think I'm glad it did, it honored the people who organized this march and their campaign to try and resurrect the names of the dead Jews of Lithuania. And uh, this is something I support greatly. I don't think we're gonna get very far because they were so successful in eliminating our memory that the names simply no longer exist. But I made this film and on the basis of this rather, as I say, schmaltzy film, I, I got a call from Lithuanian television who offered me this great uh, opportunity to make a film, which I called uh, somewhat pompously, Letter to Lithuania or My Letter to Lithuania, in which I wanted to unravel the various threads that were going through my mind. And they were offering me a large sum of money to do this. And so it seemed like a very creditable um, um, journey. So I started this film and in doing so, I became aware of a large number of dissident thoughts, dissident intellectuals uh, who had a very different um, um, perception of what had happened in Lithuania. Uh, if I can quickly mention these people, I think it's worth it. The first is David Katz, Professor David Katz, who runs a website called Defending History. And it's a brilliant website, a brilliant resource of Holocaust denial in Lithuania. And basically uh, defending history's view is that there's a double genocide theory going on where Lithuanians, Lithuanians say, oh, we were the victims of the communists. Then we were the victims of the Nazis. There's a double genocide going on and we are completely innocent of everything. It's absolutely ridiculous and it's an insult to Jewish people everywhere. But this is the bullshit they tell us. The next people, person I'd like to uh, draw attention to is Ephraim Zurov, who I'm sure many of you will, uh, all of you will know, who's done a fantastic job in confronting Lithuania and together with his co-author, Ruta Vanagaita, who herself is an exceptionally brave Lithuanian woman, has told the truth about her search for the truth in Lithuania. And uh, their book is most definitely worth reading. Um, I'm afraid I've forgotten the thing, but I'll find out the title of it and put it up later. Um, now, the other two people for me were Grant Gochen, who you've read about in the blurb, and Sylvia Foti, and I will talk of them later. But as I did this film, I became more and more determined to tell the truth about Lithuania. And I started telling my runners this, the, the uh, production company in Vilnius that was managing this film for Lithuanian television. And very soon I became aware that actually I was expected to do the bidding of the genocide center. So I started asking direct questions. Can I represent the history of the Jews as I wish to? I come from a, um, a, a British view of documentary making where essentially the documentary maker has uh, the freedom to, uh, to write and to say in his, his or her film, whatever he or she wants. Then I started getting back these kind of um, uh, emails written in this weird Soviet-like communist talk saying there has to be a ministry of truth on this and uh, it has to be approved experts who can discuss uh, the fate of the Jews or as they always call them, our Jewish citizens, ha ha. Um, so the upshot of this, I became aware 
that I was not in any position to write this, that this film that I was doing, in which they kept offering me money, why? Because Jews love money, that was the reason, uh, that I was to have no agency in how the Jews were portrayed. This was entirely the responsibility of the genocide center, uh, at which point it became clear what I had to do. I sent them a two word email and the second word was off. I was now free. So what I decided to do was make my own film without any funding. And I decided to base my film on two extraordinary people called uh, Grant Gochen and uh, or Goshen, as he calls it, and Sylvia Foti. By this stage, of course, I was fully aware of the extent of uh, Lithuanian Holocaust denial. Uh, so I was in, under no impression that, uh, that we had many friends in the government, or I'm afraid to say the courts and the other institutions of Lithuania. Um, before I start describing my film and the stories of Grant Gochen and Sylvia Foti, it's necessary for me to tell you a little bit about the town of, of Plunga in Lithuania or Plunyan in Yiddish. I, again, if there are many South Africans here, some of you, some of your families almost certainly will come from Plunga. Plunga was a small town quite like Bije. Uh, there were, I think, 1,800 or 1,700 Jews in 1941. Uh, we were 50% of the population. And I'm afraid, once again, I have to relate some, uh, some, some, some terrible stories of what happened to us, because it is the truth. As soon as the Soviets left, the, the fascist Lithuanians, or well, rather the nationalist Lithuanians, moved in. There were a number of terrible atrocities. I will just mention a few. One was when they uh, kidnapped a large bunch of very young girls, uh, took them into the woods, and there was a rape party for over a week, during which all these girls were literally raped to death. They were then chopped up and left in a, a, a position where everybody could see them in the town. Uh, there was another group of, I think there were 74 Jewish schoolgirls who were told, ah, oh, if you convert to Catholicism, you'll be saved. So these poor girls, with the permission of their parents, their families were converted to Catholicism, but then they were killed along with everyone else in the customary way. They had something called the demon dance, where they would get a two elderly Jews, one a tall man and another a short man. They would put an impossibly heavy log on their shoulders and tell them that they had to dance comically around a raging bonfire. This was obviously a drunken game. Um, and uh, the upshot of it, of course, was that the two uh, Jews were killed. Often they were thrown into the fire and burnt in that way. But this caused great merriment to our tormentors and happened liberally around all around Lithuania, including in Plunga. But the worst atrocity by far was the, uh, was the uh, abduction and the incarceration of all the Jews of Plunga in the local synagogue, which was a very beautiful building in the middle of the town center. About 800 Jews were incarcerated there for three weeks in the summer heat. If anybody here has been to Lithuania in the summer, you will know how hot it gets. They were kept there for three weeks with no food, no water, and no care of any kind. Every so often, they would kill another Jew and they would throw the corpse back into the synagogue so it would rot. They were kept like this for three weeks. After that, they were then tricked. They sent some ambulance looking trucks because the Jews realized they were bringing trucks to take them away to kill them. So they said, no, no, this is gonna take you to the hospital. The, the, the people piled in, they were taken to, I think there were 10 killing sites around Plunga and everybody was murdered. There were 2,500 Jews, I think, murdered in these, uh, in these, uh, in these forest clearings around the city. And there were very, very, very few survivors. Now, the man in charge of all of this, of the incarceration, of the way the Jews were treated, was a Lithuanian nationalist called Jonas Noreka. This man actually lived opposite the synagogue in a stolen Jewish house when the, when the, when the starvation and the murders and the tortures were happening. Uh, this man, eight years earlier, had written a little Lithuanian Mein Kampf, where he called for the elimination of the Jews from Lithuanian life. Um, and today, this man is a public hero in Lithuania. His statues are everywhere. There's a, a school named after him. And the government does everything it can uh, to protect this man and to, uh, and to sanitize his, uh, his reputation. 
Um, it's necessary for me to tell you how they do this. They do this in a number of ways, but the key organ for this dissemination of Holocaust disinformation is a, a truly repulsive organization called the Genocide Center. Now, the Genocide Center, its official name is the Genocide and Resistance Research Center. Its job it is to employ bogus historians to make up lies about the Holocaust. They employ about 120 people, and it is their role to basically sanitize the many Holocaust mass murderers who Lithuania currently hero worships. It is not just Jonas Noreka. I'm aware of at least 11 people, and many of them committed atrocities far worse than Noreka. But this is done through the, through the genocide center. Um, Grant Goshen, all of his families were murdered by Noreka. And for the last 35 years, he has been launching a one-man campaign to try and bring the truth out. He has taken 35 legal cases out against the Lithuanian government, all of which he's paid for, and none of which has been successful because the Lithuanian government, the courts, and all the other agencies never look at the substantive issues. They strike down all his cases on the narrowest and most tendentious of legal grounds. So we still have not had our day in court in Lithuania. Now, Sylvia Foti is another extraordinary woman. She is, to my mind, an Eshet Chayil. This is a woman who was brought up in Chicago, a sort of Lithuanian princess. Why was she a princess? Because her grandfather was Jonas Noreka, who is a great hero in Lithuania. And she was brought up to believe that her grandfather was a great man, a most courageous martyr, because he was murdered cruelly by the communists uh, against the fight against communism. And... Uh, in her early 20s, when her, mother and her, when her mother was dying, her mother was an opera singer and a writer, and her mother gave her the task of writing the official biography of her glorious grandfather, Jonas Noreka. It was a deathbed wish that she should do this. So Sylvia started this job thinking she was going to write the great story of the great Jonas Noreka. But when she started researching it, and the more she researched, the more she realized that this man was the mass murderer that Jewish dissidents had claimed he was. Now, I want you to ask yourself what you would do in this situation. You know, Lithuanians are very like us in some ways. They're a small, closed, rather paranoid community. They have a deep, a deep loyalty to their culture, their tradition, and their history. Uh, but what Sylvia did on facing this, and it took her decades, where she faced up to this task because she is an honorable religious Catholic woman, and she decided she was going to tell the truth. In the course of this, she lost her marriage. A daughter died of a drug overdose during all this. She lost her country. She lost her people. She lost her community. I think we as Jews can understand what a commitment and what an act of courage this was. And I want you to bear all this in mind when you hear her story. And hopefully you will see my film, which, which features her story. Now, if I may, I'd like to, Matan to run a seven minute trailer of the film that, I may, that I've made. Uh, this has been my um, contribution to this fight for truth. And then I will return to you afterwards and tell you roughly how I feel we, we should respond to this insult. Okay, thank you, Matan. Who were these poor Jewish girls? forced to strip naked before their slaughter. We shall never know. Their Lithuanian murderers didn't just rob them of their lives. They also took their voice. This film will be that voice. Lithuania a land of Jewish bones. Torture, rape, mass murder, everywhere. Stories so terrible, they can barely be told. These are the Jews of Plunga. In June 1941, these people were brutally driven from their homes and imprisoned in the synagogue in the town center. 
Over 1,300 people were incarcerated here for almost three weeks in the summer heat. No food, drink, or care of any kind was offered. Many died. Of thirst, hunger, suicide, murder. Inside, bodies decomposed. People went insane. And their torment only ended when on July the 15th, the survivors were dragged out in groups to nearby forest sites and butchered. Babies and small children were buried alive or had their skulls smashed against trees to save bullets, a practice common throughout Lithuania. This was the man in charge, a Lithuanian nationalist called Jonas Noreka. This is where he lived during the slaughter, in a stolen Jewish house, right opposite the dying synagogue. This is the booklet he wrote, Lithuania's own little Mein Kampf, demanding the elimination of the country's Jews. These are his signed orders for the imprisonment and deportation of the Jews. This is a man who murdered perhaps 14 and a half thousand Jews, who led an empire of robbery, humiliation, torture, rape, especially pedophile rape, and cruelty almost beyond human imagination. And today he is a public hero in Lithuania. What would these poor girls say? They would say that this is unacceptable, an insult to the Jewish people and the victims of the slaughter. And they would cry out that the world, Jewish and not Jewish, has a duty to respond to this enduring, unnecessary and dehumanizing insult. We are going to respond with the truth. The truth about Jonas Noreka. The truth about the depravity of the killings and the overwhelming voluntary participation of thousands and thousands of Lithuanians. And the truth about Lithuania's government, the world leaders in manufacturing Holocaust lies and defending Holocaust mass murderers. Fortunately, there are people telling the truth. There is Grant Goshen, whose family was murdered in Lithuania and who has been bravely fighting the Lithuanian government for years through the courts. And there is Sylvia Foti, an extraordinary woman whose story we are privileged to tell. Because Sylvia Foti is the granddaughter of Jonas Noreka, the man who slaughtered Grant Goshen's family. The level of cruelty is depraved. Essentially the darkest, most sadistic side of humanity possible. And for me to be part of that, at least by heritage and blood, is so painful. I, I want to disassociate myself from it. And the only way to overcome it for any Lithuanian is to accept this truth and finally come out with it and face it. That is the only way to cleanse. How should Jews react to all of this? Here you've got a perpetrator nation telling us that their national heroes or the people that murdered our families. Where is our humanity? Where is our dignity? Where is our self-respect? For Lithuania to come look me in the face and say, we love you, but our biggest national hero is the murder of your family, it's an insult. It is, it, it, it goes to the core of our being. Either we have self-respect and we tell them we will not accept these, these deceptions. Or we sell our families 
and say it's of no consequence. It is of consequence. Our doomed girls have one final question. Does the Holocaust matter anymore? Every year the world says it does. Frau Merkel says so. Monsieur Macron says so. NATO says so. The EU says so. Often. But if Lithuania can hero worship mass murdering Jew haters and lie about their guilt in a most sinister and deliberate way, then how can the free world possibly win the battle against ethnic, racial, religious, and anti Semitic hatred? This is the truth, and it has to come out. What Lithuanians did to the Jews has to be faced by Lithuanians themselves. And my hope is, Lithuania's not the only country in this position. There are other Eastern European countries just like this. Maybe Lithuania could be the leader in this, to do it. The way Germany was the leader uh, all those years ago. But in this round of coming to terms with it, Lithuania should be the leader. The brutality of the killings and how pervasive they are demands a response. They demand truth-telling because this level of cruelty can never be repeated in the world. If we do not identify this and call it out as inhuman, it will happen again. Hi, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you were able to see it. I know the sync was a bit out, but I think you got the gist of what was being said in the film. And I'm delighted to say that the Australian GIF are prominently running this film uh, in this year's festival in October and November. So kola kavod to Lindy and Eddie Tamir, and thank you very, very much. Um, I want to try and elicit how scandalous this is. And let me do it in this way. Imagine if Germany set up a historical institute to study the Holocaust, employed 120 pseudo historians to lie, and came up with the justification or a sufficient doubt to exonerate Eichmann and to relaunch Eichmann as a national hero and to put his bloody statue everywhere. This is what Lithuania does, and it doesn't do it once, it does it everywhere. This year, Kaunas is the so called European city of culture. There are literally dozens of monuments and street names and schools and playgrounds named after mass murderers. How does Lithuania get away with it? I'll tell you how Lithuania gets away with it. Lithuania gets away with it because Jews do nothing. We do not stand up for our own people. We allow them to get up with, to get away with this. Imagine if these were black people. Imagine if it was black people who was incarcerated, prisoned, raped, tortured. Would black people stand for it? Of course they wouldn't. Would white liberals stand for it? Of course they wouldn't. Would any decent people stand for it? No, of course they wouldn't. But we allow this to happen with Jews, with, with Jew, but we Jews allow this to happen. We host them in our synagogues. We, we, we butter them up. We visit them. We beg them for passports. We beg them for grants. And this is how they get away with this, with this hero worship of our mass murderer. Look, I understand there are many good reasons <clears throat> for wanting to avoid the Holocaust. Uh, for one thing, Lithuania supports Israel. For another thing, there are practical reasons, <clears throat> the allure of a European Union passport um, and other things. Um, but mostly, I guess it's the avoidance of pain, that we Jews are forward thinking. We're pragmatic people. <clears throat> Our belief is in life, not death. So we want to get on with things. We want to avoid the terrible memories of the Holocaust. And, and that's why we tend to overlook this. But my view is we cannot, and we cannot for this reason. When I made this film, I struggled to find out what voice I should give it. You know, any documentary needs a voice. Was it going to be my voice? What did my voice matter? Was, it, was I going to be trying to be objective and do a little bit from this side and a little bit from this side? That wouldn't tell the truth. 
So in the end, I decided to be the voice of the victims, to finally give them their say in this. And what would they say? They would say, this is unacceptable, that we should not accept these insults from Lithuania. Um, the matter of honor is very important. It's important because of the way they treated our people, particularly our women and our elderly. It means that there has to be a response to this degree of dehumanization, which they enforced on us. And to my mind, the dehumanization is reiterated by the scandal of Noreka. How can we accept their offers of friendship when they the hero worship the guy who murdered us? Um, you know, we always say never again, and I've no doubt that we mean it. I've no doubt this will not happen. We have a strong Israel. We have an incredibly strong Jewish community all over the world. But to my mind, never again also means another thing. Never again means that we will never again be insulted in the way they insulted. We will never again be dishonored in the way they dishonored us. We will never again be dehumanized in the way they dehumanized us. And they are getting away with it. And as you know, it is time to respond to this. Okay, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'd love to hear them. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I must apologize from the start. My screen went blank and therefore um, I lost uh, my notes. But um, we're going to uh, move on to question time now. I have two questions um, for the moment and uh, we're, we're open to uh, further questions. Um, the first question um, is from Eva Zelesnikov. Eva, can you unmute yourself or can Matan unmute you and you can ask Michael your question directly, please? Sure, I would love to. Excellent presentation. Uh, thank you. I wanted to know if you did any research about how Holocaust education is being taught in Lithuania today and what specifically the narrative is that's being taught in regards to the Lithuanians' involvement in, in the killings. Thank you very much for that excellent question. Um, first, the first thing to say is unlike in Germany, the Holocaust is not part of the national curriculum in Lithuania. You see, Lithuanians don't regard themselves as in any way guilty of it. So they would say there's no point in them being part of it because they had nothing to do with it. But there are these, th these institutions called um, tolerance centers and much is made by the propagandists on the Lithuanian side to show how much they're doing to understand and uh, apologize for the Holocaust. But even with the, um, with the tolerance centers, they are voluntary. Only a minority of schools, of schools take part in this program. And generally from what I could see, and I did visit one of these places, um, what they teach the children is gefilte fish, uh, how funny Jews are, uh, wonderful schmaltzy Yiddish songs, uh, nice uh, ethno ethnic pictures of Jews with beards. There is absolutely no attempt to deal with who committed the Holocaust and Lithuanian culpability. Absolutely none. In fact, everything Lithu Lithuania does is to deny all of this and to stop any legitimate inquiry into its behavior during the war. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Michael. The next question comes from Ian Light and he asks, you mentioned uh, Israel. Uh, he asks, what is Israel doing about this? Um, Hi, Ian. This is a, a, another difficult question, and I can only give you my point of view. Personally, I don't feel it's Israel's responsibility, this fight. I believe this is the, the fight of the Jewish people. Israel is a nation state. It has to survive in the world. So Lithuania's votes in the European Union and the United Nations is obviously important. So are its trade links and its study links. I don't, want, uh, I don't feel the burden of, of, of this fight should be put on, on Israel. Having said that, I feel Israel is strong enough to do more, to do, for example, what it did with Poland recently. And it distresses me greatly that the Israeli, uh, the IDF has uh, recently announced that instead of taking its soldiers to Poland, they're now going to take them to Lithuania. No, they should they have nothing to do with Lithuania, in my opinion. But at the same time, I don't feel we should put all of this on Israel's shoulders. Of course, there are other people who may have completely different views on this, but that's, that, that's my position. And there are a number of questions then that follow on from this, Michael, and that is uh, the general question of what would you like to see uh, being done, not only by this audience, but in general? 
and there's been some suggestions come from the audience. Um, Ian Light, for example, suggested sanctions on, on Lithuania, demanding that the statues be destroyed, uh, no um, NATO membership, etc. Do you have any other ideas that you'd like to put forward? Uh, excellent, Ian. I think one of the principal things we should do is calibrate our relations with Lithuania. They do everything they can to butter us up. They're constantly sending their ambassadors to our synagogues. They're constantly inviting us to these Litvak art days. They, they, they're constantly doing the Jewish spiel. And really, I, I have no objection to us participating in these things, but I think we should calibrate it. Every time we go to one of these, we should ask about their policy of, of sanitizing our murderers. My own view would be to boycott them entirely um, because other, if we don't do that, they will take no notice of us at all. And also at the higher levels, we, we should uh, ask their, we, our community leaders should ask their ambassadors, what are they doing about Noreka? How can they justify this? And at the same time, pretend to be our friends. As for the statues coming down, <laughs> I don't actually agree that the statues should come down. For me, it would be far better if Lithuania admitted that Noreka was a mass murderer anti, uh, uh, of Jews and a notorious anti-Semite, but we think his statue should change. That would be a sufficient rebuke to that country. Of course, if they did that, the statues would eventually have to come down. But I don't think we should follow the line that statues must come down. I think that's a very crude approach. My view, all we want is historical truth. It's up to Lithuania where they want to mass murder, where they want to honor mass murderers. I hope that garbled reply was clear. No, that was great. Thanks, Michael. Um, Gail Zinn, you raised uh, your hand. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, I won't come on video. I just want to comment um, on your energy. Um, I'm a child of a survivor from the Shovel Ghetto who's only recently passed away. Um, I've been part of a community of survivors from Lithuania, mainly based in Israel, who have had a paper going for 60 years, trying to address the cruelty of the Lithuanians and the lack of response. And so this is just a comment and please keep your energy going. And if you have, if you need a following or people to do work with you, I think, you know, it's just remarkable to feel that at this stage when the survivors are gone, that they're people that are prepared to tell these absolutely abominable stories that no one's ever heard. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so much for that, girl. May I interrupt, Ed? Um, yep. Very quickly. Sorry, that's a great comment. And uh, it, uh, what, I, what I don't want people to depend on guys like me. You know, I'm an old, exhausted bloke. I, it's taken me two years of nonstop work to make this film. I can't do this campaign alone. And we are such a clever people. We are such a motivated and good people. We have to take it on ourselves to do something. Do not rely on me or even Cedric. We have to get together and decide how we are going to let the Lithuanians know what we think. And I hope small groups form and get together and talk to Cedric. Of course, I'll be happy to try and coordinate it, but it needs a democratized approach. And I promise you this, we cannot rely on our community leaders. We cannot because they are so imbued with this idea that we have to let Lithuania off the hook that it just makes no sense. And they never discuss it. So that's also what you could do. You could approach your community leaders with warm relations with Lithuania and, uh, and force them to justify this. And if they can, fair enough, but they can't. It's intolerable. So just to add to that, um, Gail, I think that um, just to add to Michael's response, um, I do believe that um, a groundswell of, um, of uh, dissent coming from people from all over the world is what may, may be able to, to generate this. Michael's been uh, pushing this angle together with Grant and others. Um, and I think that um, if we can share views off, offline uh, to see what can be done and putting our heads together, uh, Michael certainly has expressed this in other forums as well that he would be happy to do so. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly happy to uh, be involved. And um, so anybody else that wants to uh, join forces on this, um, I can only um, welcome that. And uh, you know, let's see what we can do. 
Helen said, so should we organize a group to specifically focus on this issue to help Michael socialize yes. his research? The answer to that is categorically yes. Um, and um, there are a few more other comments. These comments, by the way, uh, we gather um, by virtue of the fact that the, the proceedings here have, have been recorded. Um, so we can collate these comments and we will share them amongst those who um, have voiced a, a desire and interest to be engaged on this. Um, and um, we can take it from there. So there are, um, I'm going to take one final question. So if someone would like to um, raise their hand and ask a final question rather than a comment, um, I'm more than happy to do that. And if not, I'll move on to bringing the evening's proceedings uh, to a close. So if there is a, um, a further question, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, Rona. Yes, I put a few comments. I wonder if you read them, but it's a very important moment. Uh, Kaunas is the culture city of Europe. Correct. And this is the time you can approach them, Kovna Ghetto was the main thing and the way uh, um, because it became a concentration camp and the only one in Lithuania. Uh, I did put a comment that 10 years ago a book smuggled in potato sex was translated into Lithuanian and donated to Lithuanian schools. It's an anthology of 50 children, child survivors from Kovna Ghetto. So I don't know if Michael know about this book. Have you heard about it? It was a big meeting there. Um, and the other thing that in Main Street in Vilnius, you don't see the stomps, you see the plugs for the heroes, so-called heroes. Yeah. So I think because it's a culture city, would be really very important if you could show your film there. Mm -hmm. Any chance? Can you <laughs> get in like... touch with them? Yeah, I thank you very much. Uh, whenever you approach the Lithuanians about anything, you are immediately directed, as a journalist, you are immediately directed to the Holocaust Center. So I have stopped talking to them, to be honest. And well, I tend to... You... Yeah, sorry. And I, I, I've heard of this book, but I haven't seen it. And thank you very much for drawing my attention to it. Well, it's, I'm one of the authors. So Congratulations. Mazel tov. Anyway, one of the babies who managed to survive. And by the way, my mother was recognized as a Jewish rescuer. The only one in Lithuania. Fantastic. So Kolokot. you have heard about this as well, probably. Yad Vashem doesn't recognize. It's Bnei Brit. Jewish rescues. Uh, anyway, um, thank so you. if thank you, you could Rana. approach, if you could approach Ninth Fort, not the yes. Holocaust Center, but the Ninth Fort, it's it's a museum there, and um, throw the film. You don't have to go to the Holocaust Center. The other thing please. is Emmanuel Zingiris. Have you talked to him? I've spoken to him. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, Rona, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, bring the proceedings uh, to a close. I would like to, on behalf of everyone here this evening, to thank Michael profusely for his wonderful, thought-provoking um, message. I think there is a call to action here. I would call on everybody else um, who finds this call to action of interest, um, we would be more than happy at March of the Living Australia to um, centralise those comments and include that with, uh, with, in, in, with Michael and some of his other collaborators worldwide. Um, so please, let's utilise this forum. Um, I hope that everybody will be able to see the full-length movie at the time of uh, the Jewish International Film Festival. Um, in October, and hopefully Michael can come out then in person and be there for, for, uh, for that premiere. Um, and without further ado, 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody being here. I hope you found it as interesting and uh, totally um, awe-inspiring and uh, hopefully we'll move everyone to do something about this uh, travesty of justice. Um, I will end off by saying that um, on the 26th of the month is Holocaust Survivor Day last year, 2021. Uh, was the first time at this anniversary recognizing and celebrating the Holocaust survivors around the world was celebrated. We ran a wonderful event then a year ago that is recorded and on our website. We will be holding some um, events this year around the 26th of, of uh, June, and uh, we would love everybody to participate. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that in April 2023, we will be back. March of the Living International will be back. We will be going on March of the Living uh, live once again. Anybody who is interested in joining us, please join, look on our website, or please scan the QR code that's on the screen at the moment and express your interest, and we would love to see you join us. Thank you very much, and good evening to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.